and thank you once again for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Randy Viegas, and I'm currently uh, here in Kern County, where I'm a native. I've been connected to the organizing and youth narrative change efforts in our region for over seven years. I'm currently a PhD student in the politics department at UC Santa Cruz. Like some of you that have joined us today, I have a deep commitment to addressing challenges faced by the most marginalized residents of the Central Valley of California. As a son of Mexican immigrants, I witnessed firsthand many of the issues that affect youth and their families in the Valley. Issues like air pollution, poverty, the school to prison pipeline, a lack of opportunities for youth, racial discrimination, and the vast amounts of economic inequality that you can witness simply by driving to the other side of the 99 freeway. From Bakersfield to Stockton, each region of the Valley brings its own unique challenges, but perhaps not surprisingly, uh, those most negatively affected by our pandemic remain the most underrepresented among our electorate. Before we begin our formal welcome message, I wanna remind you all of the purpose of this webinar and our space. We seek to bring attention to disparities in health, understood broadly, and service provisions in the Central Valley. We wanna highlight some of the youth organizing work to advance civic engagement and combat health and other disparities. And we also wanna attract support for grassroots youth organizing and other efforts that address some of these disparities in the Central Valley. As we facilitate this webinar via Zoom, I want to just kind of inform you all of some housekeeping rules. Our chat box will be moderate, monitored for any technical assistance. Uh, and when you use the chat box, you should have two options. One to send your chat only to our panelists and another to send your uh, message to panelists and attendees. So keep that in mind uh, when you write. For the safety of all of our attendees, if any disrespectful comments are shared in the chat, uh, that person will be removed from our webinar. But we encourage you to post your questions uh, in the Q&A chat box or at the chat box on the right of your screen throughout our events, and I'll be reminding you. Uh, our Q&A session is slotted for the end of our webinar and is open to all of our panelists. But if there's a specific question that you'd like to address to a single panelist, uh, please indicate that in your question so we can uh, address them specifically. And when you ask your question, please feel free to share your name, your organization affiliation in your question. Today, we're grateful to the Irvine Foundation for funding this webinar. We'll be hearing directly from lead academics, as well as organizers and practitioners who are on the ground directly to address these issues. We'll also be hearing from Ellen Braf Guajardo from the Sierra Health Foundation. We also wanna recognize that many of you today in our audience are directly engaging to provide much needed support to our communities during this time. And for that, we wanna say thank you. Now, I would like to invite you all to please welcome Dr. Manuel Pastor, Distinguished Professor of Sociology and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He is also the director of an organization that is a co-sponsor of this event, the USC Program for Environmental and Regional Equity, also known as PEER. He is the author of the book, State of Resistance, What California's Dizzying Descent and Remarkable Resurgence Mean for America's Future, and among other things, he was most recently selected as a member of Governor Newsom's Task Force on Business and Jobs Recovery in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. He will now provide us with a brief welcome. Please help me welcome Dr. Manuel Pastor. Um, thank you and uh, thanks to our partners at Santa Cruz, particularly the UC Santa Cruz Institute for Social Transformation and Veronica Tariques and partners at Berkeley like uh, Irene Plumerand as well on this project. Um, I want to provide welcome. So welcome, glad you're here. But I actually wanted to provide a little bit more of a context of what are sort of the key things that are going on in this moment of the COVID crisis that set the context for understanding the importance of this project. I only have five minutes, but I have 10 things. So let me do them very quickly. First, uh, the crisis, uh, which is a disease, has revealed our underlying illness. That is, the level of inequality that we've got in a society, the level of people who don't have a, in, uh, health insurance, the level of people who are unprotected. Second, it's, left, it's really made evident uh, the kind of employment precarity, uh, that is people who've got gig jobs, people who've got jobs that have disappeared uh, in retail and uh, in uh, food services, and also uh, the challenges that people are facing in agriculture, which is a very important, of course, to the Central Valley. Um, the sort of third big thing that I think that the crisis has revealed to Californians is that we're an immigrant state. 
25% of our folks are immigrants. Half of our children have at least one immigrant parent. We've got 2.4 million undocumented Californians, nearly 70% of whom have been in the country for a decade or longer, and they've been frozen out of unemployment insurance. They're frozen out of the federal relief package. Uh, and while we are an immigrant state, we have a federal government that doesn't recognize our reality. There are other kinds of realizations, I think, that are coming from this crisis. The fourth thing that I would say is that we're deeply interconnected. The basic public health principle is that we protect ourselves when we protect everyone. And we've begun to recognize that the level of inequality, employment precarity, and ignoring the, uh, the precarity of status for so many immigrants is running a risk, not just for those populations, but for everyone in the state of California. We are connected. The fifth big realization is that government is the ultimate backstop to a good society. Imagine trying to solve this coronavirus crisis with the free market. It would simply be a recipe for wealthy people to get tested and be safe and a recipe for poor people to be abandoned. And in fact, that's part of what's going on right now in terms of the way services are being actually delivered. It's something that people need to sort of struggle about. The sixth thing I think that we've recognized as a result of this crisis is who is an essential worker, and it's not a hedge fund, a hedge fund manager. Uh, it is an agricultural worker, it is a grocery store clerk, it is someone who's a healthcare worker, it is someone who's a bus driver, it is work that we have not been rewarding with either the right kind of pay or the right kind of respect for the nature of work, and this crisis is teaching us who is an essential worker. Uh, last couple of things that I would say, and I'm actually gonna make the five minutes. Uh, uh, number seven, we can't go back to where we were before. We should not be talking about recovery if it's reversion to a level of inequality and disenfranchisement that in fact made us uh, vulnerable to this crisis in the first place. Eighth, uh, we need to reconnect. And what that means is that we need to reconnect communities that have been separated, and we need to reconnect regions of the state that have thought that their fates are different. Coastal California and Central California, we are one California. And we need to make sure that the way in which the state has ignored the Central Valley and its uh, residents is something that doesn't get perpetuated um, into the future. Uh, ninth, in order to really rebuild a California that works for everyone, worker and community voice is central. If we want to know how to get back to work safely, ask workers, not necessarily people who are going to profit by them getting back to work in a dangerous situation. If you want to know how to protect communities, ask local communities who are the trusted community partners who can deliver information about testing and the risks of COVID and not simply public health officials or furloughed state workers. How do we get promotores involved? How do we get people who have been exiting from the incarceration system who actually have trust? And 10th, the last thing I'll leave you with is that ultimately it's about power. No matter how good our research is, no matter how much we prove that protecting all immigrants in terms of health care would be good for the state or raising the minimum wage won't cost uh, unemployment or ensuring that young people get a good education is a good thing, the research has demonstrated that for years. Ultimately, the way that we make those things happen to create the conditions for them to happen is through power. And that's why I'm so pleased to be giving a formal presentation to this report because it's all about lifting up the Central Valley, it's all about worker and community voice, particularly youth voice, and it's all about how do we do the power building to create a more just society in this COVID crisis and beyond. Five minutes, 18 seconds, sorry I went long. You did great. Uh, thank you so much for that inspiring and, and thought-provoking welcome, particularly as many of our communities are being disproportionately impacted by this pandemic and are disproportionately those essential workers that you are referring to. Um, now, however, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you, our audience. So in order to do that, we're going to do a little bit of an icebreaker, and I hope you'll join us in participating. I'm going to ask you two questions, and I would like you to please respond via our Zoom poll that should be appearing on your screen shortly. And those two questions are, one, what is your relationship to the Central Valley? Are you a Central Valley resident? Do you work in the Central Valley? Do you go to school there? Uh, are you a former resident of the Central Valley? or does your work touch on Central Valley issues and conditions? And our second question is, what sector do you represent? Is it organizing, academia, philanthropy, healthcare, a legal sector, or something else? 
So we'll give you about uh, a minute or two to respond, and then we'll take a moment to see who's in our virtual room today and, and sharing this space with us. I also realize many of you uh, may be able to check off many of these boxes in many different ways. Um, so please just do your best to you know, stick to one, or I'm not sure if multiple choice is an option. But thanks for participating, and uh, we'll get to our results shortly. I think they were supposed to have Jeopardy music in the back, so Randy, maybe you could hum. Yeah, I have I have terrible tone, but I can try. <laughs> or let me see if maybe I can I can pull up audio on my phone. <laughs> Let's see if you guys can hear all this. like most of us have responded to the poll as much as I'd like to listen to Jeopardy music on loop forever. Uh, so according to our poll, 30% of our audience today are Central Valley residents, 6% work in the Central Valley, 1% uh, you know, uh, go to school, 8% are former residents, and 54% a grand majority of you all have work that touches on many of these issues. Uh, so that's great. We also see a good variety of people in terms of you know, sectors. We have people who are involved in organizing, academia, philanthropy, healthcare, uh, the legal sector, and others. So awesome. Thank you so much for filling out our poll, and I hope you were able to see those uh, results as well. It's great that we have such a wide variety of folks joining us today. Uh, we really hope you learn a lot and stay engaged in our conversation throughout. Once again, I want to remind you that uh, that chat box is available to you uh, to, you know, really speak to any comments you have. I, I love you know, seeing you all engaged. Uh, make sure to write your questions there so we can get to those at the end. Um, we're running a little ahead of schedule, uh, but thank you all for participating in the poll. So now we're gonna shift um, and we're, we're gonna give some of that extra time to our panelists. And so now we're gonna hear from UC Santa Cruz professor, Veronica Tariquez. Dr. Veronica Tariquez is an associate professor of sociology and her research focuses on social inequality civic participation, immigrant integration, and youth transitions to adulthood. Informed by over two decades of connections to social justice movements in California, much of her research has implications for local and regional policies affecting immigrants and other low-income communities of color. Today, she's sharing some of her work that is focused on California's Central Valley. So please help me welcome Dr. Veronica Tariquez. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for facilitating today's event. And Manuel, thank you for doing a great job in framing the overall discussion. As usual, you're on point. So I, I'm somebody who's spent time in California looking at trends in civic engagement, immigrant, edu immigrant integration, educational outcomes. And one of the things that I hear consistently from youth organizers in the Central Valley is that the Central Valley is the heart of Cali. Um, but I hate to say this, California has a heart problem. Uh, at least according to some indicators of health and well-being, environmental issues, when it comes to educational attainment, the Central Valley is not doing well. And in some instances, I think it resembles rural USA more than it does the coastal parts of the state. Sometimes I have to remind myself that the Central Valley is part of California and that California is the fifth largest economy in the world. It's a serious injustice to see the types of inequalities that we see in the Central Valley. So um, one of the things I want to remind the audience is that the Central Valley is very diverse. 52% of residents are Latinx. And they're joined by an important, small but important African American population that is growing in some parts, and also a pretty sizable Asian Pacific Islander community that includes Filipinos, Hmong, Vietnamese, and individuals of Punjabi descent. 
The majority of residents are residents of color who work in essential jobs in the agricultural and related interest industries where they're risking their health and well-being during this pandemic to put food on our table and to put food on the table of people across the country and in other countries. And so the vulnerability of the residents in the Central Valley is confounded by the lack of social infrastructure as well as of high poverty rates. So over one in five residents in the Central Valley live in poverty and one in four children are also experiencing high levels of poverty. So I'm, going to sh I'm showing you a map now um, of the Central Valley. And in this map, the darker shades of orange represent areas with higher levels of poverty, while the lighter shades have a lower proportion of residents living in poverty. Latinx and other residents of color disproportionately reside in the areas with high poverty. Whites comprise less than a third of the residents in the region and they tend to concentrate in the, in the communities with the lowest set rates of poverty, the lighter areas of the map. But I've got some good news. Over the last decade, there's been a growing effort by youth organizing and civic engagement groups to engage young people from some of these, the highest poverty communities in addressing some of the many concerns in the region with funding from the California Endowment, the Irvine Foundation, Sierra Health Foundation, and other philanthropic groups. We've seen the number of youth organizing groups grow from just a few in 2010 to at least 20 in today. And currently these groups are engaging their members, young people from the poorest and more marginalized communities, and they're helping them feel connected and supported during this pandemic. They're providing them with valuable information, with analysis of what's going on. And they can, as they did before the pandemic, they're engaging them in trying to identify possible solutions to the many problems in the region. So just prior to the pandemic, I had the privilege of surveying these groups to find out what kind of issues they're working on. And because many of them regularly engage high school students and young adults, it may not be surprising that a lot of them were working on issues of educational equity, higher education access, uh, school discipline reform. Um, but given the disinvestment in social infrastructure in the region, particularly for the young population, 45% were working on some kind of campaign that sought to increase statewide or local government resources for youth programming. And this can help make youth organizing sustainable in the region, as well as a whole range of different types of service programs for young people. Um, the other issues, set of issues that the groups were working on had to do with immigration and health. And that's not surprising. Uh, there, there's many immigrants in the region. The Central Valley has one of the highest proportion of immigrants in the state as a whole. And uh, unfortunately, the rates of deportation have been particularly high because of cooperation between ICE and local police. Local police. So immigration is a salient issue given the poor air quality, the uh, pesticide spraying, high asthma rates, health is another common issue that groups have been working on. Additionally, some have been working around criminal justice, uh, LGBTQ rights and gender equity, and other issues. And I wanna note that um, just prior to the pandemic, there were just a few groups, three out of the 20 I surveyed in the region that were working on affordable housing issues. But given the current pandemic and the crisis around housing, they're now, some of them are involved in coordinated efforts to stop evictions. And this speaks to the infrastructure that's been developed over the last decade among groups in the region. Now I have another bit of good news. Um, among the 20 groups I surveyed, 17 of them had been engaging their members in voter education and outreach, with of course some devoting more resources and time to, to voter outreach, but I think that's particularly important. 
And um, I've spent a bit of time observing some of these efforts. So back in 2018, my research team and I collected extensive data on civic engagement efforts. Um, I spearheaded a program called the Central Valley Freedom Summer, which engaged UC Santa Cruz and UC Merced students from the region in an effort to support on the ground efforts, but also to document the process. Um, this effort was inspired by the 1964 Freedom Summer, in which college students teamed up with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to register rural residents. And um, I think one of the, one of the important thing, things that really stood out for me during this process, as someone who's observed youth organizing across the state, is that the young people in the Central Valley evince uniquely high levels of eagerness to work on campaigns and to get out the vote. It may not sound like the coolest thing, but they were really eager. Um, and in part, I think this had to do with the dearth of other types of opportunities for young people to get involved in the region. Additionally, they were really, they really connected with the issues that the youth organizing groups were addressing around such as immigrant rights, environmental justice, and other issues. Um, and the other thing that I think has stuck out for me as a researcher who's interviewed and talked to young people across the state is that young people in the Central Valley are less likely to learn about the voting process or civic issues from their schools when compared to those in Los Angeles or the Bay Area. And, and so in the Central Valley, there's a particular reliance on uh, these youth organizing groups to really educate the broader public around the voting process or give them analysis around issues that they're facing in their communities. Uh, the success of this group has in part to do with the fact that they do ethnic studies, gender studies, LGBTQ studies, really give young people a set of um, understanding of change that's happened in their own communities. Some of them are learning about the United Farm Workers struggles and other multiracial struggles for the first time. And I remember I was struck when I talked to one high school student who graduated from um, a school in Kern County and, and lived uh, not too far where, from where the, a lot of the farm worker struggles had taken place. And she told me, she said, I learned so much more about the USW in one summer here through my youth organizing group than I did in four years of high school. And I think she was particularly inspired to continue that legacy of social change. I also want to share that between 2014 and 2018, we saw a 262% increase in voter turnout among the youngest voters, those 18 to 24. And of course, some of this had to do with young people's general reactions to the national political climate and even you know, the small increases in the population. But the fact that there were 17 groups engaged in doing some kind of voter outreach made a difference. And I can say this confidently because I conducted an experiment. I worked with the Power California Network uh, the groups that were involved in the network at the time, 99 Roots, Act for Women and Girls, Californians for Justice, and Mi Familia Gota, to test the extent to which young people calling their peers on the phone and, and also doing social media outreach had a difference in turnout. And uh, this is a teaser. I'm going to share a report at the end of this webinar that shows the results of the experiment. But I can confidently say that young people increased turnout. So as you're going to hear today, um, young people are continuing to support um, youth organize their members during this pandemic. They're connecting with them. Um, they're still doing work around elections. They're so providing a critical network of support. Um, and this has an impact not only on social issues today, but for the longer term. Research has shown time and time and again that when young people get involved, and at a young age in local community issues, when they vote early, they stay engaged for the long run. So an investment in youth organizing is an investment for an, into an active citizenry for the long term. However, young people in the Central Valley have an uphill battle. The infrastructure in the region is weak. Social services and other 
programming and some of the institutions that support the health and well-being of young people in the communities are often lacking or they're under or they're under resourced and to learn more about some of the service gaps in the region i'm going to turn it over to uc berkeley sociology professor irene bloomrad dr bloomrad is the founding director of berkeley's interdisciplinary migration initiative and we're really lucky to have her here she's a national leading scholar on immigrant integration she and manuel are like the powerhouses of immigrant integration so um thank you both scholars senior scholars for being here and i'm going to turn it over to myrene thank you so much veronica um Thanks everybody and um, thank you very much for taking an hour of your morning to be with us today to talk about um, some of the research but especially some of the organizing that's going on uh, in the Central Valley. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if you hear a little bit of background noise. Uh, my two kids, like so many, are, are doing online learning so there might be uh, a little bit in the background of asking them to, to try to keep it down. Um, we at the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative have been working on a mapping project for the last year that brings together demographic data on immigrant populations with information on healthcare and immigrant legal services. Uh, and our goal has been really to support those who are on the ground doing the activism or making decisions by giving a bird's eye view of some of the inequalities that Veronica and Manuel talked about but with an eye towards immigrant service provision. And we want to inform activists, philanthropists, decision makers, whether they're local officials or legislature, legislators in Sacramento, and we want to provide evidence-based information. Um, at BME, we started, because we're in the Bay Area, we started on the nine county Bay Area, but then in partnership with Veronica, we extended this research to the Central Valley. And this is gonna be our first time sharing some of that research on the Central Valley. So it's a real wonderful opportunity to do this. Um, and I just wanna also add that one of uh, BME's miss, uh, missions is to um, provide the skills for mentorship and training to um, students and especially to first generation or immigrant origin undergrads so that they have the tools to then go out and do their own evidence-based social change. Um, and so a lot of the research you're gonna see here um, was collected and cleaned by uh, a large number of undergraduates and graduate students at Berkeley, and actually at Santa Cruz as well, at UC Santa Cruz. All right, um, you know, nobody who's on this webinar can ignore the fact that uh, COVID-19 is obviously affecting everyone and especially people of color. And as both Manuel and Veronica um, talked about, also immigrants in particular. And this is because they are essential service workers uh, working in the field, say in the Central Valley, or maybe working in an assisted living facility, working in meat packing um, across the country. And then also, as was mentioned by a number of people who have already spoken, because there's an additional vulnerability to people, for example, in the Central Valley, who have had poor air quality or exposure to pesticides that when you get infected, the chances of getting very ill are higher. And we're seeing more and more research um, that suggests this. Uh, and then add on to that, especially when we're talking about immigrant populations, the, the precarity of status and the fear that comes with precarious status that might ha lead someone to not seek medical assistance right away or make people more wary of reaching out um, to a public agency for help with food if, if you're having trouble getting um, enough groceries. Uh, and it's in this context that we really want to share our research, looking both at the spatial mismatch between where health clinics are located and where vulnerable immigrant populations are located, but also looking at legal clinics because our view of health is um, a pretty broad one. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about um, the data that we've assembled. Um, I'm going to ask Cynthia, can you go back one slide? I think we have a health clinic uh, slide first, or maybe not. Interesting. We've, we've jumped across a slide. All right, let's go for, let's go for the legal aid clinics. Um, so what we did in our research is we assembled uh, data um, from a series of databases um, and, uh, hang on, Cynthia, if you can just go back one. 
Um, go back one more. There we go. So let me tell you about the two data sets we had. We have a data set where we looked at health clinics, and these would be um, federally uh, mandated health clinics um, through the Health Resources and Service Administration Data Warehouse by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and we geocoded all of the health clinics across the Central Valley and in the Bay Area. And then in addition to that, we added on data from legal aid clinics, focusing particularly on legal aid clinics that do immigrant services. So this would be help with asylum uh, applications, deportation defense, U visas, uh, even naturalization applications. So we're looking particularly at the legal clinics that are helping immigrants. Um, and our thought here again is that health is not just a matter of physical health, but it's also the mental health that comes and, and the issues around mental health that comes with precarious status. And then also the use of say legal clinics to help you uh, advocate for your physical health, for access to health uh, services, and potentially to advocate against um, uh, employers who are forcing people to work or not providing sufficient uh, protective gear. And so we're taking a very broad view of sort of the infrastructure that is needed. All right, so we have our geolocated legal aid clinics, we have our geolocated health clinics, and then on top of that, now we can go to the next slide, on top of that, we have put demographic data from the American Community Survey. Um, and so this is U.S. Census Bureau data about demographics such as the percent of the population that's non-citizen, the percent of the foreign born in poverty, the percent of the foreign born without health insurance, um, and we overlay that with the clinic data. Now we know that immigrants are likely undercounted in these kind of demographic surveys, but they're by far sort of the best that we have when it comes to this broad bird's eye view of um, the situation. So we recognize that people who are on the ground uh, might have more detailed information, but we're really trying to do this comparison. So we rely on the Census Bureau data. Okay, next slide, wonderful. This is what the outcome is. So this is a screenshot of one of our mapping spatial inequality tools. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be sharing the URL with everybody so that they can go on this website because what we have done is we've tried to make this an interactive website that anybody can use. And when I say anybody, this can be an activist, this can be a philanthropist, a local decision maker. And um, in fact, you can use it if you are a member of an immigrant family just looking for services. So one of my undergraduate students who was working on this project actually ended up using this map to identify health services for a recent family member who came to the country and is seeking asylum. Um, so we want this to be used by a wide variety uh, of people. Um, if you look at this map, uh, you can, and I'm gonna ask Cynthia just to advance the slide once, you can see here that the map is looking at the foreign born without health insurance. Um, and Cynthia, if you can do one more. Um, over on the left-hand side, a user can change the demographics that are shown on the map. So um, in this case, because we're interested in health insurance or people who lack health insurance and therefore are vulnerable, we see these broad inequalities, especially in the Central Valley when it comes to a lack of health insurance. But depending on your interest, you could also look at the number of households who speak Tagalog, and you can change between health clinics and legal aid clinics. So again, this is a map that we are using to both provide information directly to immigrants and immigrant communities so they can identify health services, um, but also to decision makers, makers, philanthropists, and activists so they can look at their local community and sort of get a sense of how their community stacks up against other communities. Now we've done a little bit of that analysis, and if we just move to the next slide, I'll share some of those results. We're going to be publishing a number of data briefs in the coming weeks, um, and I will show some information at the end on how you can get access to those. So the graph that you see in front of you, or the figure that you see in front of you, um, looks at how many um, sort of low fee or um, accessible health clinics there are per 1,000 foreign born people without health insurance. And so you can see at the top places like Turlock and Merced, we have almost four health clinics per 1,000 uninsured foreign-born person. But if you look at the bottom, if you look to uh, Lodi, 
um, Arvin, Mendota, you have very limited healthcare facilities for every 1,000 foreign born without health insurance. Um, Cynthia, if you can advance the slide once more. Now, the left side shows you the supply, how many health clinics there are in a particular location per 1,000 people. On the right-hand side, that map shows you a little bit the demand. And so the circles there get bigger as there are more and more uninsured foreign-born residents of the location. So you can see, for example, Stockton, Fresno, Bakersfield are where the biggest populations of uninsured are, but we see pockets all through the Central Valley. Now remember, the darker colors are the ones with more health clinics. So you see Merced there in dark blue, but notice in Stockton, Lodi, Lodi, and Tracy, um, there's very, like the, the light color shows that there's very little health clinic coverage, even though the population of uninsured foreign born is quite high. Cynthia, if you can go to the next slide. Now let's turn to legal aid. Here, when we look at legal aid, we do the same calculation. So we look at how many legal aid clinics there are per 10,000 low income foreign born. So we've changed our population metric here no longer to be health insurance or lack of health insurance. We're now looking at low income people who probably could not afford a private attorney. And we see that in places like Redley or Vesalia, you have a fair number of clinics available per 10,000 low income foreign born. But in 14 different communities in the Central Valley, there is not a single um, immigrant service providing legal aid clinic um, in the area. Um, Cynthia, if you could advance once more. And then again, we can see the difference between supply and demand. Uh, here you see that Fresno has by far sort of the largest uh, population of low income immigrants. Um, and the sort of the, the presence of legal aid clinics is, is okay, not great, but okay. And then you can see though in all the small little towns around uh, some of the bigger uh, population centers that there are no legal aid clinics. And so this raises obvious issues of inequality and the need then to drive far distances or if people don't have access to car, how to get to these places to get some legal aid services if public transportation is poor um, in many of these places. All right, Cynthia, next slide, please. Now here we do a comparison with the Bay Area. And again, the focus being on what kind of information can we give to activists, philanthropists, and decision makers to maybe uh, mitigate some of the inequities that we know exist in the Central Valley. If you look at the average in the Bay Area, there are 2.25 offices doing immigrant services legal aid per 10,000 low-income foreign-born compared to only one in the Central Valley. And interestingly, in the Bay Area, um, wine country is doing reasonably well. So Napa is actually the place with uh, the most support. And then we see that the big centers, San Francisco, Oakland, is doing reasonably well. And then again, we have a number of suburbs and bedroom communities where there's very limited um, service support. So, you know, to the extent that we can help people, we want to provide this information so that people can go to decision makers and foundations and say, look, you know, there's clearly a need in the Central Valley. All right, next slide. Um, I'm gonna end shortly, I think my 10 minutes are up, but I wanted to signal to everybody that we are now doing some extended work on this mapping project where we're adding in data about infection and mortality related to COVID-19. So we are replicating these maps, we've taken the health clinics, we've added on hospitals now, and we're overlaying that with infection rate, rates. You can see here a snapshot, sort of a screenshot of uh, what we're working on. This is for Kern County. And so it includes the information that I've previously talked about, but now on the right, you can actually see the increase in COVID cases in Kern, the COVID death increase, unfortunately, and then mortality rates. And we are actually gonna to try to be extending this to the entire country in the next week or two. Um, and we are going to share with you the URL for our beta version of this map um, at the end of the webinar. And we very much would appreciate feedback on how to make this better. So you all are gonna be seeing this for the very first time. We have not released this previously um, and you get to be our guinea pigs to try to see if this is helpful to you in your efforts um, related to activism in the Central Valley. Um, next slide. 
just to wrap up, um, I wanted to let you know that we at the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative are working on a number of reports that are coming from this work. We have previously done reports on the mid-sized cities of the Bay Area and responding to the public charge rule. Um, next slide, please, Cynthia. Um, these are the URLs to the two maps. Um, as I mentioned, they're now publicly available, though the COVID one is still pretty beta. Um, we would ask that people try them out and uh, definitely send us your feedback. Um, did we miss things? It's very likely we're pulling from databases and so we don't have the same on the ground information that many of you um, have. And we'd also like to hear what would be most useful to you as we extend our efforts. Um, there's some information here to stay in touch and especially if you would like to get copies of the data briefs, which will include some of the figures and the bar charts that I've shown please shoot us an email or follow us on Twitter and we'll be releasing those um, uh, data briefs in the next week or two. Um, I think that's it. And so I just want, if you can go one more slide, Cynthia, I just want to acknowledge everybody who has worked on this project. As I mentioned, when we started, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative is about research. It's about public engagement, but it's also about mentorship and teaching. And so we've been really privileged to have so many students working on this project. Um, and directly trying to advance uh, evidence-based social change um, in our state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Blumrad and Dr. Tarikas for your wonderful analysis and key insights on these issues and disparities. Uh, next, I wanna take a moment to introduce our next panelists, Crisantema Crisi Gallardo and Jose Orellana, who was actually one of the research assistants on that project. Uh, first, I'll start with Crisi. Crisi is a daughter of immigrants from Oaxaca and Guanajuato. She was born in South Central LA and has now lived most of her life right here in California's heartland in the Central Valley. Uh, she loves and considers Merced her home. The youngest of three children, she was the first in her family to attend college, graduating from UC Berkeley with a BA in Peace and Conflict Studies with a concentration in culture and identity. Seeing her parents struggle as farm workers really motivated her to return to Merced and continue organizing for racial and economic justice. Crisanthema brings a decade of community organizing experience and believes that youth are the promise of transforming communities. In 2017, she co-founded 99 Roots, a youth group that uses art, culture, and healing to organize youth, youth of color, and build an unapologetic justice movement across the rural Central Valley. In her spare time, she loves spending time with her nine-year-old nephew. Our second panelist, Jose Salvador Orellana, is the lead organizer and co-founder of Loud for Tomorrow. Born and raised in Delano to Salvadorian refugees, he began organizing uh, through UC Santa Cruz through the Central Valley Freedom Summer Project, which Dr. Tarika has mentioned earlier in 2018. It was in this work through the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment and Central Valley Freedom Summer that really ignited his passion uh, for working with youth and community organizing in his hometown. And after witnessing a powerful summer, Jose, along with other Delano youth, founded Lod for Tomorrow to continue building community and youth power. So thank you both for being here today, and I'll turn over the floor to you. Thank you, Randy, and everyone that is um, joining us today. Um, again, Crisanthema, my gender pronouns are she, hers, ella. And I am from Atwater. It feels a little bit surreal to be um, joining this conference call from my hometown. Um, right now, someone just texted me, one of the youth texted me an article that came out in the Merced Sunstar um, that named Atwater a sanctuary city for businesses. Um, I share that because that's the community that I grew up in. Um, I moved here when I was about 10 years old from South Central LA, uh, mostly black neighborhood, came to Atwater um, when it was very, very small, and it was a total culture shock. I'm the youngest of three, um, so my older siblings had a really tough time at school. Um, we quickly realized that schools were very segregated here. If your parents were farm workers, you only hung out with other children whose parents were campesinos. Um, and what really, I think, impacted my um, growth or just my, the way that I viewed the world was um, the same high school, um, actually where our first club started, at Water High School, um, you also have the, the children of ag business owners. So the same white men that were exploiting um, the labor of my undocumented dad, their children 
would actually um, go to the same high school and we would share space, not really engage or talk, um, but we just knew that they were the, the richer, more affluent students um, who never got in trouble at school. Um, growing up here, I unfortunately um, saw my brother fall into that school to prison pipeline. Um, to this day, he's in, in and out of prison. Um, and then when I was 16 years old, my older sister um, was murdered. And that really um, shifted the pathway that I was headed in. Um, I felt like I, I was the only one left in my family and that I had to go to school. All I could think of was my parents saying, mija, tienes que irte a la universidad, al colegio, para que no termines como nosotros, right? Um, I was lucky that I ended up getting into UC Berkeley and that really um, transformed my life. I didn't have the best grades, I wasn't involved, but I, I do think that um, we all have a pathway that um, Creator has set out for us. And for me, it was leaving the Central Valley um, at 17, when I got to the, uh, the Bay, I said I would never come back um, to the Central Valley. But I was fortunate that that first semester, I found other Chicana um, students who were in this club, Chinachli, and that's where I really became politicized. I had to struggle through unlearning a lot of shame that I carried because of the, the identities that I held. Um, I also found my power and my voice um, through healing circles, through organizing groups that had been established in, in Richmond, in Oakland. Um, I was able to really find my purpose and my passion. So after graduating, I moved back home, did what I never thought I would do, um, come back to the Valley, um, to Atwater. Um, and when I moved back, I, I really wanted to organize and work with folks in the community that were coming from the same experiences that my parents were still struggling with, right? Like I came back and my brother was still in and out of prison. My dad is still undocumented to this day. Um, and in that process of building community, really learning from undocumented women and, and formerly incarcerated folks that um, helped me learn and, and become the organizer that I am today. I also realized that my passion was in youth organizing and creating um, spaces where young people could become politicized and also shift power in these local communities. So I share uh, all of that because I, I think it's important for me to just be transparent about what drives me in organizing, where I come from, because it has really shaped the way that we engage young people um, in 99 Roots. If we could go on to the um, next slide, please. Um, the next one. And yeah, almost two years now that 99 Roots started, um, we're building an unapologetic youth movement of young folks of color throughout Merced County and Fresno County. Um, we want, I really think it's critical for young people to initiate their, their journey into social justice through healing work, where they can really reflect on their identity, their lived experiences, get exposed to ethnic studies, get exposed to art that depicts different cultures um, so that they can find their power. Um, next slide. Knowing that um, we needed to create a space where young people could also gain skills um, to run campaigns, to speak in public, and to understand that nothing is, nothing happens by accident in, in our local communities. It's designed institutions, entire, entire systems are built around us in order to make profit of, uh, by taking our dignity away, right? And so we, when we finally found a name, 99 Roots uh, from the 99 Highway, um, we knew that we needed to engage in electoral organizing 
and expand the democracy, right? Like I, I was politicized in a space where we would say we don't engage in electoral work because that's, you know, feeding into um, the white man's world. But I got checked real quick as soon as I came back to, to the Central Valley and organized in my own community. I could say things like that in, in the Bay Area, right? But when I got I came back, it was the undocumented mujeres that I was organizing that told me like, you're talking from a, a place of privilege. Um, and it was when I realized the, the need to really mend the grassroots issue organizing with the political, um, we need to get the, the vote out. We need to get our young folks to even um, be registered to vote because in my community, young people weren't even registered. Um, no one would approach someone that looked like me to ask me to uh, come out and vote and make my voice heard. So in 99 Roots, we are expanding our democracy. We're building the skills of young people to really um, feel inspired by their culture, by their histories, and to also use peer-to-peer -peer outreach to engage young people in weekly meetings where they become politicized, they identify the issues that they are more passionate about, um, and they also register um, their fellow students to vote. They also put on community educational events, um, and they get the experience of being the organizers themselves. Um, no change is gonna happen in the Central Valley if we don't do both. We can't just view electoral work as its own thing. We can't phone bank our way into liberation. Um, and the way things are set up right now in every single county across this region, we need to register young people and we need to um, transform the entire electorate in order to pass the policies that we know our families deserve. Um, next slide. In this moment, um, you know, the, the week immediately after um, stay at home orders uh, were declared, we met with our base of, of core young people. Um, and the schools here in the, in the region were slower to actually announce that they weren't going to be um, having in-person classes anymore. Um, so there was a lot of miscommunication with families, with students, my own nephew, I'm, I'm his guardian and I get all his elementary schools like text messages. It wasn't until a Sunday night that they texted me and said, "Never mind, they're going to be off for the next two months. Um, and they had denied um, what was happening um, because of who is on our school boards, who is um, our superintendents. Um, I share that because when our families finally realized that this was going to be something more long term and that they were, gonna, they were going to be at the forefront of taking care of everybody across the world because literally farm workers feed everyone across the world. Um, that's when our struggles were just amplified to a whole nother level. Um, the struggles that we experience every day in the Central Valley are now being talked about everywhere because it's impacting people in bigger cities, um, in communities that tend to have a lot more access to legal representation when it comes to evictions or any issue around immigration. Um, and so for us in our entire Power California network, we knew we wanted to center like the four R's of, of relevance. Once, one is relationships. How do we talk to our young people um, to assess what their needs are and also um, movements move at the speed of trust? So how can we talk to other organizations across the region to build that connection in this moment? Um, to talk about, you know, what are the gaps that we're seeing? And so that was our immediate reaction. How do we talk to our partners? How do we convene other amazing youth organizations that are also doing work in other counties, in the same counties, right? How can we work together? Two, it's real. Y'all just saw the facts, right? Um, legal services, um, financial services, even access to free food and clean water. 
are things that our communities don't have. And we knew that as a region, um, it was gonna be a priority. How do we get money to be able to give people the financial support that they need to even purchase water and have access to clean drinking water? Um, how do we get people to also influence where resources go? Because in this community, not only are you know students of color and low-income folks struggling, we know that our undocumented folks were completely left out of any uh, policies that were going to support them. Um, and so we wanted to be able to influence where resources that are being fundraised um, were going to be um, going and dispersed. Also, the third R is our resiliency. We've been surviving in the Central Valley, right? Like, I look at the young people that organize um, in 99 Roots, and every day I'm reminded of the power and the strength that they have. Our struggles give us that power. Um, and it's not, it's not easy to now be at home, sometimes in households where our identities aren't accepted, where we're not safe. Um, and we started implementing monthly, actually weekly circles, um, those first couple weeks to just have a safe space for young people to talk about what's, what was coming up for them. How do we have circles for you all to um, just name what's on your heart? Um, because our schools don't provide those type of social emotional um, supports that they need. And then, well, uh, the biggest opportunity that came up for us was developing a rapid response and recovery plan. Um, we know it's not just up to the individuals, it's also the entire systems and institutions that are around us. We need to make sure that um, students that are coming back from universities, high school students that are engaging in mutual aid are also pushing forward policies that are gonna impact our lives. Um, the next slide is just an example of that. Um, as we engage um, in our alliance of Power California, um, we have partners like um, Siren, FBU, CFJ, um, Act for Women and Girls. Together, we're coming um, as a region to come up with demands and priorities, um, housing, healthcare, access to water, to clean air, um, to youth investment. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're creating a narrative that is uplifting the needs as a region because we know that to win, it's gonna take a united Central Valley. Um, and yeah, just the last slide is a little bit more about us. If y'all, the next one. Um, if y'all wanna follow us or you want more information about other members of our Alliance, feel free to um, check us out on social media. I'll pass it to Jose. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being on this call. I'm really excited to, to talk, to share with all of you the amazing work that's happening here in Delano and Kern County. Um, it's, such a, uh, a, um, it's such a shock, or, or it's such an experience to hear my whole uh, beginning or journey of joining into uh, youth organizing, as what Tarika mentions with Central Valley Freedom Summer. Uh, so before I start to talk about uh, Loud for Tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and how I moved into um, youth organizing. Um, so here's a picture, my favorite picture of all with uh, Dolores Huerta, who's an idol for us here in the Central Valley in Kern County, who represents the resilience and power of community building. Um, so my journey with youth organizing started when I left um, the left my home uh, to UC Santa Cruz uh, to start my undergrad um, journey. Um, like Chrissy's mentioned, I was a youth who, like my peers, really believed that if you want to be successful, if you want to be um, with, if you want to make your parents proud. Um, you have to leave the Central Valley to make a name for yourselves and to find other oppor opportunities that the Central Valley lacks. Uh, so that's what I did. As soon as 
I could, I left to UC Santa Cruz to find my community, uh, to find a place that accepted me for being a queer youth, for accepted my Salvadorian uh, ethnicity that I didn't, I didn't find here in um, Kern County. Um, and as soon as I went, I enrolled into business courses and computer science because I thought that that's what I needed to do. Um, and out of luck, in the middle of a really rough period for myself, I found Central Valley Freedom Summer. And to me, it was like a miracle. Um, I was completely lost, didn't know what I was doing, um, and just needed a place for myself who knew the struggles that I was facing at home, who knew the struggles that I was facing as a human being. Um, and I was walking down the sociology uh, department and I saw this flyer that said Central Valley Freedom Summer. And for the first two years, that was the first time I saw Central Valley somewhere. Not in my books, not in my classes. We didn't mention anything about the Central Valley. When I would tell my, um, my roommates where I was or my housemates, and I said, I'm from the Central Valley, everybody really didn't understand where that was. And I needed to point to them into a map to identify where it was. Um, I didn't know what it was, the program. It said an internship. Uh, it said it was paid. It said community research. I didn't know what that was, but I just wanted a place where the Central Valley, um, where we talked about our experiences and where I knew that these people were home. Um, and that's what I did. I joined Central Valley Freedom Summer and it was a personal transformation for myself. Um, I still can't believe what had happened. Um, I joined Dr. Terriquez and it was a beautiful journey. I learned about, for the first time, I really learned about deeply about um, the farm labor movement, about Cesar Chavez, about the Plan de Deleno, about all this rich history that I didn't know existed when I lived in the town that birthed this whole place. And I joined, um, and in, in the summer of 2018, uh, which feels like forever, I came to the Daily for the first time in three years um, and worked at the Center of Race, Poverty, Environment um, with CVFS to um, register youth, young voters of color, get them into youth organizing, and do all this new stuff that for myself and for the people that I was engaging had never seen. And it was life-changing. Next slide. So um, I'm here as part of Laugh for Tomorrow. Uh, we're a youth-led organization that's based in Kern, Delano, Kern County, and we're building youth power to transform our schools and community through civic engagement, advocacy, and community healing. And how we started Loud for Tomorrow really starts with Central Valley Freedom Summer. So next slide. So this is a picture of the culmination of 10 weeks of hard organizing, sweat, and tears. Um, it was I still remember the day I woke up at 6 a.m. in the morning. Didn't know if people were going to come, but so, as you can see, like more than 100 people came throughout the day. And even our, our, our personal idol, idol uh, Dolores Huerta, came and gave us a visit. And it was, it was a life-changing experience. For the first time uh, throughout that summer and that day, youth like myself, um, who were born in the Central Valley, who didn't know anything about our history or how, what kind of power we had. We're learning about ethnic studies, about uh, youth organizing, about environmental justice. It was a beautiful experience. And after those 10 weeks, um, we, me and my co-interns -inter were like, we don't want to stop doing this because it is amazing. What we are doing is actually changing people's lives. We had young people come up to us and said, are we going to do anything after this? Are we going to build an organization for ourselves by youth for youth for the first time in Kern County? Um, and we honestly, we didn't know what we were getting into. And me and my co-inter were like, yeah, let's do this. Um, and that's where Loud for Tomorrow came about. Um, and what our vision was is beyond Central Valley Freedom Summer, we wanted to create something stable, something by youth for youth, and something that really listens to the youth voices. Uh, because in, in the Central Valley, like everywhere, youth voices are not taken seriously. 
Uh, I'm still 22 myself, just turned 22 on Monday. Um, and still to this day, my voice isn't heard at anything at city councils, at state legislators, and we really want to build that power. Um, so our vision for uh, Law for Tomorrow, next slide. We wanted to continue doing the youth organizing that we did in Central Valley Freedom Summer. Uh, we wanted to write um, legislation for our school boards, for our city councils. We want to continue doing voter registration. And we wanted to do the political and organizing training that we would never seen here. Um, environmental justice, health justice. Um, that was something that's so connected into our lives. But in schools, we don't learn about that. We don't learn about the health inequities that are caused by the systems, by the oil drilling that's happening right behind our backyards. And we wanna continue giving that to our students. Um, and most importantly, what we wanted to do is learn about our history because that's what's gonna move us. We have such a rich history done by our elders in Kern County that we need to remember and we need to honor by learning them and by building off that legacy. Because without them and without their hard work, um, we can't move these systems that were not built for us. So next slide. So since then, since the fall of, uh, of 2018, we've been prioritizing making youth spaces um, because of the lack of them, right? We wanna continue mobilizing young voters. We wanna create a, a healing of culture where we're able to have safe spaces and institutional spaces where we could heal from the personal traumas that we're dealing on a daily basis. Um, and most importantly, we wanna create that youth voices and decision-making at all levels, from school board meetings, city council meetings, all the way to the state legislator. We wanna make sure that young people of color, um, like myself from Kern County, are able to have a voice and shift systems and policy measures. So next slide. Um, and what we came up with is with the theory of change that we have to build youth power to reignite the legacy of our ancestors that started the, the farm labor movement and the Plan de Delano in order to shift that narrative of that there's no opportunities here in Delano, that there's nothing's going to happen, that um, these systems are still going to pollute us. Um, we want to change that, that narrative just like our soil that we have here in Kern County, we have endless possibilities um, to create um, something for ourselves. So next slide. So how our youth power is seen is at school board, school board meetings, uh, city, um, county board of supervisors, we're out there using real community data and storytelling to be able to advocate for the needs that we have. Um, we've been creating youth-led research to be able to come up with policy measures to reduce the health inequities that are happening in Kern County that are so detrimental. Um, now in the COVID crisis, we're shifting our policies to make sure that there's a rapid response system to be able to um, uh, advocate for our needs through the digital spaces. Um, since uh, COVID-19, uh, decision making at the city levels are getting speed up and voices of our community members are not being included. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the city of McFarland um, passed, uh, passed two ICE um, detention centers and it was something that the community had first um, um, stopped, but because of COVID-19, there was a system where community voices weren't allowed into the 100 uh, people cap on Zoom. And we need to create that system that we're able to rapidly respond to these measures and um, be on um, the COVID-19. Even if there's not a real door to get our voices in, we're still gonna make sure that we are in, in the system to make sure that we shift these policies. Um, and thank you so much for being able to uh, share this space. Um, if you want to follow us, um, we're at Loud for Tomorrow on all social media. Um, and you could go to the last, last slide. Um, yeah, so go ahead. 
And yeah, so like I said, um, we're a youth-led um, organization here in Kern County. We're building power for our schools and communities. And even if COVID-19 isn't allowing us to have to physically move people into these spaces, we're gonna move them whatever way we can to the digital space. Um, so thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it on to the next speaker. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Chrissy and Seth, for sharing all of your amazing work with us and for continuing to lift up youth power and community. Um, and I also wanna you know, just share that I love seeing all the messages of support and shout outs in the chat box. And I wanna remind you, uh, to really you know, drop in your questions for any of our panelists, including Jose, Chrissy, um, so we can get to those questions at the end in our Q&A session. I wanna now introduce one of our final panelists. Before we begin that Q&A, I wanna introduce Ellen Braff Guajardo, who is the Director of Regional Programs at the Sierra Health Foundation, and she would like to share a few words. Thank you for joining us, Ellen. Thank you. I really appreciate being invited to participate in today's panel. I'm so inspired by the speakers and you know when I look to see who all of those 90 something participants are um, I you know it really gives you a lot of hope um, for the future because as Manuel said at the beginning it really is about people power right it's about movement building uh, and you all are the leaders in that um, you know, I have the privilege in my role of serving as the senior staff on the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund, which many of the folks um, um, participating in today's webinar are either funders or are partners um, of. And the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund is a community-driven funder collaborative. Over the last five years, we've been able to support our over 140 community-based organizations in the San Joaquin Valley, um, and with more than 30 funders contributing to that. Um, and you know, while the goal of the fund is to advance health and racial equity in the San Joaquin Valley, um, and the priorities are set by the community partners, and those are around you know immigration health, housing, education, environmental justice, and land use and planning. We recognize that underpinning all of that is the critical importance for civic engagement and community organizing and, and mobilization. Um, it's, it's, you know, I've come to recognize over the years that, that you know, organizations that do service work uh, it, it's super important, right? Vulnerable communities definitely need all that service, but the service work will continue forever. The needs will continue forever if we don't get to the roots. And so then you think, okay, well, it's all about policy and systems change. Well, it is about policy and systems change, but you know, you can pass policies, but if those systems don't then effectively implement them, then it really isn't about policy and systems change. It's about that people power. It is about you know ensuring that that uh, that those systems and those policymakers are held accountable by you all, by the leaders, by the youth. Um, and you know we talk a lot in philanthropy about the social determinants of health right what really influences folks opportunities um, what influences their health yeah part of it is access to medical care but a lot of it is about where we live the air we breathe the water we drink the pesticides we're exposed to or not exposed to etc um, but when i think about it really you know what people power is the ultimate social determinant of health and so I really, really appreciate and thank you for what you've been doing. As part of the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund, um, you know, we've been able, it, it, with that recognition of the community organizing and grassroots leadership development, et cetera, we've been able to support a lot of census outreach. Many of you are, are funded partners um, for census outreach. We've also been able to support a lot of emergency response to COVID-19 here in the Valley. In fact, as of this morning, we have we have awarded grants, almost $2 million worth of grants for emergency response. But, but you know, COVID-19 didn't create 
the racial inequities that we're seeing, right? Um, you know, how the impacts of COVID-19 are on which groups of, you know, which communities of color. And all COVID-19 has really done is uncover, right? Reveal, kind of expose what those racial um, inequities are. And I think you all know that, and I really appreciate the work you're doing about that because, you know, this is a moment in time. It is about, you know, building public will. It is about, you know, understanding that we can't live in a society like this. We have to do better. And it's with all of you and your leadership and your work and your devotion and pulling in youth to understand um, how important it is to work toward real transformational change so that everyone has the opportunities that are needed to live a healthy life you know, with well-being and with equity. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to hear from you all. I'm truly inspired. Thank you for that powerful message, Ellen. I, you know, it's truly important now more than ever to invest in the Central Valley, invest in these grassroots youth organizing and other groups and other efforts that help address these disparities, which we've come to know all. Uh, we're now gonna shift over to our Q&A session where our panelists will answer some of the questions that you've asked during our webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box or in the Q&A, uh, via the Q&A button. Our first question comes from Rosana Esparza, and this is a question directed to all, towards all panelists, so feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself to hop in. Uh, what did you learn about intergenerational linkages and connectivity and advocacy? Does anyone wanna uh, take a stab at this question from our panelists? I'll start. Um, so when I served with the youth organizing groups, I found that for the most part, um, they engage in intergenerational organizing. So they are leading their own campaigns, but they're also forming coalitions um, with older with organizations that engage older adults. And in some cases, they're pushing them. They're pushing them to, to kind of think more broadly and be more inclusive. Um, additionally, in terms of intergenerational patterns what i in interviews what i'm learning is that a lot of the young people are engaging their families um their their parents or their siblings may not have had the opportunity to be politically involved and the young people who are learning about local civic affairs or learning about the voting process are talking to their family members and engaging them i'll turn it over to somebody else Well, uh, unless somebody else wants to take a stab at that question, I'll move on to uh, our next comment slash question. Uh, one of our attendees- Randy, can you um, just repeat the, the question for me? My audio, Central Valley problems, the Wi-Fi is not that good. I heard Absolutely. your part, Dr. Terrique, so I think I know the question, but I wanna make sure. Absolutely, the question was, what did you learn about intergenerational linkages and connectivity in advocacy? Um, I echo what you shared, um, Dr. T. We, in the Central Valley, um, especially in Kern County, I feel that when, you know, why ag saw the power that farm workers, multi multicultural movements of, of working class people had, um, they were very intentional in like trying to keep us away from that history um, and that also, I think, for me, included making it really difficult for people to then organize and pass down um, the knowledge that they had from being in unions, from being farm workers themselves, right? So sometimes we don't have access to those elders, and they're still living in this region. Um, I think for me, as, as a new organizer, when I just moved back, um, to this day, um, she, I'm still in relationship with her, Doña Cecilia Mendoza. That's where we actually started we, when we didn't have an office. Um, she let us meet in her living room, and she was part of the UFW um, and was always happy to talk to the youth, um, share her knowledge about campaigns, um, and they would push 
around the intersection of issues. Um, there were times when she would talk about immigration and not want to bring up um, queer and trans folks. And young people were like, well, you can't do that. You have to um, stand with everybody and you have to talk about the intersections of what it's like to be queer and undocumented or queer and of color. Um, and I, I see like so much value in having our OGs um, share, you know, their knowledge and then also our youth just let, letting them know that things are different now and that, you know, certain tactics or ways of thinking are no longer um, acceptable in movement work. Okay, you know, at women, we know our place in this, in this struggle now. Um, we're not just going to be cool sitting, you know, in the back um, taking notes. Um, and I, I, I see it happening more um, right now, too, just in terms of, um, our older, at least in Merced County, this has been my experience, we're asking for an end to um, evictions. And young people have said, why are we asking for just that? We're worth so much more. Um, we should be asking for like home ownership. Everyone should own a home in this region. Why not? Um, and so I, I, I feel like there's so much value in just having um, folks from different generations think together. Thank you, Chrissy and Dr. Derikos for responding to that question. Um, an anonymous attendee wanted to lift up, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of information on SOGIE or LGBTQ folks. So I'm wondering if anybody in the panel has anything they would want to lift up or share um, around this. I'm not sure at what point this question was asked, so I'm not sure if it was in uh, relation to the maps um, categories or to something broadly, but uh, if that attendee wants to clarify as well, I'm, I'm happy to plug more information. If nobody wants to respond, I'll say something briefly um, or get us kicked started. Um, LGBTQ youth are highly represented in youth organizing in part because the groups create a safe space that they're not finding in schools and in other places. Um, and I think LGBTQ youth are also, um, in, in a lot of these organizing groups, are being empowered around their multiple identities and are pushing other movements to be more inclusive. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add on to that? I'll just um, share something that I've heard from young folks as well. In some of our smaller um, rural communities like Parlier and Sanger, it's easier for a young person that is part of the LGBTQIA community to um, show up to a 99 Roots Club meeting instead of going to that QSA, right? Um, and it feels safer. It's it's the place where you can really explore um, what identities you belong to or are, you know, are fluid and, and want to explore more about. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're getting close to our time here and we have one final question that I'll pose to all panelists, um, you know, especially if, if you haven't gotten the chance to answer to a question yet, but please respond. Uh, and this question comes from Ashley De La Rosa and she asks, what are some ways organizations are holding these systems accountable during this time or even prior to COVID-19? I really like this question because it's something that we've been really uh, struck, um, working our heads around. Um, and I think from our, our past uh, history of resistance, one of the great things that we've always done is use sort of storytelling to show how these systems are not working for us and how they could work better for us. And reimagining like what accountability looks like. Um, so for us, it's um, being able to use storytelling to shift the narrative of how um, these institutions have not been working for us and how we are the ones who are uh, know how our community should, what direction should we face with, should we go to. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Ellen, do you have a response to follow up with that? Uh, 
Yeah, I, thanks so much for the question. I, I just, I'll use as an example, the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund, because the partners, the community partners uh, each year put together a policy platform around those priority areas of immigration, health, housing, education, environmental justice, and land use and planning. And that policy platform you can actually find on the web under the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund. Um, and you'll see how partners have identified um, in the San Joaquin Valley sort of what the vision is for each of those areas and then what the pathway and what organizations are doing to try to get closer to that vision. One of the things I want to mention though about that is that even though there's six priority areas, those are not silos, right? A, a particular organization might be focused on housing or on health or on environmental justice, but the communities they're working with have issues with all of those priorities and so it really is intersectional uh, intersectional and i think that you see that the way that the partners in the san joaquin valley fund network for example you know work together get to know each other um, build capacity across um, is a way to bring all of you know to help break down those silos and we're by far not the only collaborative right doing that um, i appreciate all the work that's happening across silos to build power right awesome do any of our other panelists um want to take a final stab at that or looks like we're just about out of time um i want to thank you all for joining us today uh, I want to remind you that this recording will be sent out to our attendees, as well as, you know, all the lists of resources that we've been talking about throughout this webinar. Um, and I also love the fact that many of you have been sharing resources directly in our chat box uh, to each other and really lifting up your own uh, spaces, communities, and information that will help us address some of these disparities. Um, thank you once again for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>